Hollywood, California, Monday, November 2nd. The Lux Radio Theater presents Gary Cooper in The Virginian with Charles Bickford, Helen Mack, and John Howard. Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars, Gary Cooper, Charles Bickford, Helen Mack, and John Howard. Our guests, Sidney Skolsky, noted Hollywood columnist, and Richard Klein, physical trainer of picture stars. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. We wish you could all be with us tonight in our theater on Hollywood Boulevard, not only to meet our stars, but also the many other screen celebrities whom I see just beyond the footlights, awaiting the curtain of another great show. But wherever this hour finds you, a hearty welcome from Lux. This program comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, the soap preferred by nine out of ten Hollywood stars, and is yet so inexpensive that every girl can use it every day. Our message is to use all the cosmetics you wish, but remove them thoroughly, the Hollywood way, with Lux Toilet Soap, whose active lather cleanses the pores and keeps your skin soft, smooth, always lovely. Our show opens with word from our producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Here in the hometown of movies, we are so used to stars who grit their teeth, clinch their fists, and crash their way into the limelight that a man as shy and human as Gary Cooper is a complete novelty. On a Hollywood soundstage... He's as refreshing as a breeze off the prairie. Last month, the Cheyenne Indians up in Lame Deer, Montana, tried to give him a name. They called Gary Comaste. He was mighty pleased to become a member of the tribe until he discovered that his new name means Tall Handsome One. <laughs> Gary was an unknown actor in Westerns when he was called in by the Paramount Studios for a screen test. Entering the room, he faced an office filled with producers and executives. The long young man from Montana looked at the expressionless faces, swallowed hard, smiled feebly, and bolted for the door. But his personality clicked. They gave him an important role in Wings, and Gary's been soaring steadily upward ever since. I welcome him tonight as a fine actor, a sincere co-worker, a fearless man, and a close friend. Charles Bickford is also a most welcome addition to our cast. Charlie left the stage to work for me in Dynamite my first talking film, and has appeared in four of my pictures since, including The Plainsman. Charlie's no mean antagonist as a villain. In fact, it took an African lion to put him in the hospital. He will be heard tonight in the role of Trampas. Our leading lady is Helen Mack, who has been on stage and screen since childhood and is one of the most unspoiled young actresses in Hollywood. She is heard as Molly Wood. The role of Steve is played by John Howard, co-star of the film, Valiant is the Word for Carrie. And now, up with the curtain, as the Lux Radio Theater presents The Virginian, written by Owen Wister, starring Gary Cooper with Charles Bickford, Helen Mack, and John Howard. <laughs> Wyoming. In the early 1900s, the dusty little town of Medicine Bow is humming with activity, and though it's only 10 o'clock in the morning, the Maverick Cafe is filled with a noisy, rowdy gang of cowhands, whooping it up on their one day off. <laughs> From the street comes a tall, quiet-spoken young cowboy, known to his friends as the Virginian. As he steps up to the bar, he gets a loud welcome from an old pal, Steve. Hey, you gall dang mangy soup fed buzzard, who are you passing by? Steve. Nobody else but. Well, Steve, you ornery low down cousin to a bald beaver. What in blazes are you doing here? Oh, nothing special. Blew into town about a week ago. Well, I'm sure glad to see you, Steve. Say, it must have been four years since we was riding together. Four years or more. Yes, sir. Say, I heard about you being made foreman over at the Box X Ranch. 
<laughs> it kept me laughing for a week. Yeah. <laughs> well, what have you been doing? Oh, the same as usual. Working some and playing some. Uh, mostly uh, playing. Sure. <laughs> you no good, Weasel. You're just the same as always. Ain't no account to nobody nowhere. <laughs> Ain't you ever going to settle down? Oh, B? Say, what for? Buenos dias, senor. Oh, hello, Nina. How are you? Muy bien. Hey, let me introduce you to an old pal of mine. Oh, hello. Morning, ma'am. He's very handsome, no? <laughs> yeah, just a minute. Sure, he's a real lady killer, Nina. Si. <laughs> See, you better watch out for this hombre, ma'am. He's a low-down, double-barrel liar. Don't you believe a word he says? Oh, yeah? <laughs> hello. What's the argument, boys? Oh, hello, Trampers. Step right up and join in. I don't know what it's all about, Nina, but whatever it is, I can settle it fair and square. No. <laughs> in my favor. When would you get in, Trampers? Just blow it in to beat your time with this lady. Come on, Nina, I'll buy you a drink. But, senor, I am with this gentleman. You mean you were with him. Come on. No, stop. I want to stay here. Hey, I ain't arguing with you, sweetheart. I'm telling you. No, let me go. Wait. There ain't no argument, Trampers. We're getting along just fine. Not that it's any of your business. Who's talking to you? I'm just telling you. Yeah? Well, when I want to know anything from you, I'll let you know, you long-legged son of a... Wait a minute. If you want to call me that, smile. <laughs> You're getting mighty touchy, ain't you? About some things. You better be leaving, Trampas. Sure. Come on, boys. I'll trim my hide off you in a game of stud. <laughs> Say, I wouldn't mix it done with Trampas if I was you. Trampas and me just don't mix at all. Where's the Virginian? Somebody want me? Hey, Nebraska. Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh, hello, boss. Say, the Wyoming special can't get through to the station on account of them cattle blocking the right of way. All right, I'll tend to them. Come along, Steve. Sure. I'll help you clean them up. Get up there. Get on. Get on. Hey, head him this way. All right, Nebraska. Show him along. All right, get along there. You. Get along. Get down. Well, I guess that fixes it. Thanks, Steve. Well, look at who's here. Where? That girl over there. Just got off the train, I reckon. Hmm. Hey, she sure is a fine-looking female. Yeah, I'd kind of like to make her acquaintance. I seen her first, Steve. <laughs> hey, what's the matter with her? <laughs> Yeah, she's backing up like a scared calf. <laughs> hey. hey, look at her. She's scared of that milk cow down there. Hey, ma'am, that cow won't hurt you none. Wait, Steve. I'll go and rescue the fair lady. Rescue her? From what? A moo cow? Don't stop me now. Oh, 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 get away. Get away, please. Oh, get away, I said. Oh, oh. oh ho. Get out of here. Get out of here, you ornery devil. Go on. Go on, get out of here. Oh. Well, the critter's gone, ma'am. I reckon you're safe now. Oh, oh, thank you so much. It's a mighty lucky thing I happened along. A wild steer is an awful ornery critter. Oh, it did frighten me, just for a moment. If that steer had seen you face to face just like I'm doing now, ma'am, uh, he couldn't have been so bean. <laughs> oh, thank you. I reckon you're the new waitress at the Lone Star Hotel. Oh, no, I'm a teacher. Oh, the new school ma'am? That's right. I've come all the way from Vermont. Well, that sure is fine. Well... Thank you again for rescuing me. Oh, that's all right. Any time at all. Mister, mister. Uh, what's the matter, little girl? Did you see my bossy? Bossy? What? Why, uh, no. She's my milking cow. I was leading her home and she ran away. And I can't find... Oh, there she is. Bossy, here, bossy, here, girl, here, bossy. Oh. So that's your wild steer. Uh, a milking cow. <clears throat> well... You see, ma'am... Thank you so much, Mr. Cowboy. It was so brave of you to rescue me from Borsi. Well, look, ma'am, it was like this. Don't you think you'd better go and rescue that little girl? I'm sure she'd be quite impressed. But if you tried to make a fool of her, she'd probably slap your face. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. I'm sure sorry it wasn't a real steer. <laughs> Daisy, she wears a big white hat, and I'll bet your life oh, when I'm in town. Easy, boy. Who's that, the Virginian? That's right, Judge. I thought I recognized you. The doc, I wasn't sure. On your way to that welcoming party they gave him for the new school, ma'am, I suppose. That's where I'm heading, Judge. Yeah, me too. <laughs> they say she's a mighty pretty girl. Yeah, she sure is. They say, 
The Valley Ranchers had another meeting this afternoon. About rustlers? Yeah. The patience is plum give out. I tell you, the country's going to the dogs when it pays a man better to steal than to work. It ain't everybody that's stealing cattle, Judge. Some is, and it's up to us to find them out. You know, Judge, I got an idea that ain't going to be so awful hard once we set our minds to it. What do you mean? You got any suspicions? Maybe. Who? Well, it's only a suspicion, Judge. Cattle rustling's a nasty thing to pin on a man unless you got proof. Tell me who it is. I'll get the proof. No, I reckon I'll wait a while. And if I was you, Judge, I wouldn't say nothing about it at the welcoming party. No use spoiling the school I'm first social gatherer. Well, I guess this is where we wash up, Trampas. Yeah. Sure sounds like a good time in there. Sure does. Hey, Steve. Yeah? About what I was saying before. You ought to get smart. Cow punching ain't no way for a fellow like you to make a living. Oh, I know it, Trampas. A cow hand's dumb on a locoed steer. Freeze all winter and bake all summer. And for what? $30 a month and key. Sure. But making money's easy if you know how. And if you're smart. Well, uh... What's on your mind, Trampas? Nothing I want to talk about now. Well, that's when. See me tomorrow. I think you'll be interested. Hello, Steve. Oh, hello. Why, I thought you was going to wait for me tonight. Oh, you was late and Trampas dangled by, so I, I sort of come along with him. Well, uh, you ain't very choosy about your company. Maybe you'll explain what you mean by that. Nothing, Trampas, nothing. But uh, maybe I ought to compliment you, Trampas. You've got so many calves this year. I reckon it keeps you all wore out branding them. You're liable to talk yourself into a heap of trouble, my friend. Since when was I your friend, Trampas? Hmm. All right. That suits me. See you later, Steve. Yeah. Well, Steve, how about circulate around to the dance? Sure. Come on, let's go in. <laughs> Hey, there's your new school mom over there. Yeah. yeah. She looks mighty pretty in her Vermont dress, don't you? Hey, she'd look good in an engine squaw blanket. <laughs> well, uh, here goes, Steve. You're going to ask her for a dance? And I'm going to get it. <clears throat> evening, ma'am. Oh, good evening. Would you care to try a turn at dancing? Huh? I said, would you care yes, to... Yes, I hear you. You're from Virginia, aren't you? Yes, ma'am, that is, I was born there. I always thought that Southerners had such good manners. That's correct, ma'am, least way they, they should have. Well, in New England, where I came from, a man always asked to be introduced to a lady before he asked her to dance. I ask your pardon, ma'am. Will you excuse me for a minute? Certainly. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, uh, Shorty. Yeah? Come here. Yeah, what do you want? Uh, you know the new school, ma'am? No, sure. sure I know her. Well, uh, I want you to introduce me. Formal like. Sure. Yeah, come on over. Thanks, Shorty. Oh, Miss Wood. Yes. Miss Wood, I'd like to present an old friend of mine to you. We call him the Virginian. Very pleased to meet you, ma'am. Oh, yes. You're the gallant young man who rescued me from the tame cow. What's that? Tame cow? It's all right, Shorty. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so long, boys. Well, uh, <laughs> well? Uh, would you like to dance, ma'am, or should we sit down? Thank you. I am a little tired. Uh, I'd rather talk than dance. Can't talk and dance at the same time anyway. Should we go outside? Very well. This way, ma'am. <laughs> nice and quiet out here. Yes, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. <clears throat> uh, Miss Wood... Uh, there's something I'd like to say to you. Do you mind if I say something first? No, ma'am. I suppose you feel very proud of yourself for what you did the other day. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, ma'am. Well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. No, ma'am. I, I, yes, ma'am. Is that all you can say? Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, ma'am. Well, I don't think you're a bit funny. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Well, that's better. <laughs> now we're going to get along fine. You said you had something to say to me. Well, I reckon you said it already. I was just going to apologize to you on account of acting up like I did about that cow. Oh, I see. Now that's all over, and we've been formally introduced and all. I'd like very much to go riding with you someday. Oh, would you? Yes, ma'am. You ain't afraid of me, are you? Oh, why should I be? No reason at all. I'm as gentle as a plow horse. And I'm powerful, interested in education. Oh, then I do hope you come to some of my classes. 
I have several little boys just your age. I'd sure be proud. Only I don't reckon I could get away from work to go to school right now. Oh, but you could get off to go riding. Yes, ma'am. All right. (laughs) Thank you, ma'am. I'll be calling for you up at the schoolhouse. Well, uh, how do you like the new horse? Oh, she's marvelous. What's her name? <laughs> oh, what are you laughing at? Well, uh, her name is Sir Henry, but I call him Hank for short. Well, he's a nice horse. You want to get off here for a while? All right. Easy now. There you are. Oh, thanks. Oh, it was wonderful to ride out here. I love it more every day we come. I reckon I do, too. Never noticed the country much before, but coming out this way with you all the time, I like it fine. You haven't told me about that book I lent you last week. Did you finish it? That Romeo and Juliet? Yes, ma'am, I finished it. Don't tell me you didn't like it. Well, I ain't read any poetry before, but as soon as I get the hang of it, it'll be as easy as reading the patent medicine catalog. (laughs) Didn't you like the story? Well... They raised a mighty strange breed of men in them days, but in some respects, this Romeo was a pretty good hombre. Oh, indeed. Just a pretty good hombre. Yes, sir. He had his enemies and he killed them. Shows he wasn't no coward and proves he was quick on the draw. Why, you approve of killing your enemies? No. An eye for an eye? No, no, no. Not if there's an honorable way out. No, ma'am. But them enemies was particular ornery. They had it coming to them. Well, what else? What didn't you like about Romeo? I didn't like him in that balcony scene. The balcony scene? Why, that's the most famous scene in the play. Maybe so, but not for me. What's his idea in traipsing up and down a rope ladder, anyhow? Why didn't he go in through the front door? Don't you understand? Their families were enemies. But traipsing up a ladder, that ain't my idea of a real man. Well, what would you do? Go in and kill her father? That would be nice. No, I wouldn't have killed him, but I'd have had a showdown with him man to man, and if he was too stubborn to call off that fool feud... I'd have grabbed Juliet right off that balcony and married her. That was just what he was planning to do. Yeah, I know, but he couldn't stop playing actor on that balcony. Wasted so much valuable time, he got them both killed. What would you have done? Well, I ain't no Romeo, but... If I loved a gal and and wanted her, I wouldn't fritter away the time on no rope ladder making up poetry. Well, what would you do? I'll show you. I'll just take her like this. Let me go. Stop it. Stop. There, that's what I'd do. <laughs> you're, you're just as sure of yourself as ever, aren't you? Molly, don't play act with me. We don't fool each other. We ain't on no balcony. Molly, don't you think the spring is the prettiest time of the year to be married? I don't want to be married. Oh, Molly. Well, not yet, anyhow. I've got my school, and I'm just getting started, and... Teaching school. That ain't no woman's job in life. It's mine. Oh, I, I like you, and I admire you. I'm not sure of myself yet. This country's so new and strange. I feel like an an alien, an outsider. Oh, I don't know how to explain it. But I just feel that I'm, well, different. Hmm. Women are funny, Molly. I don't understand them. Well, I'm glad you think you don't. What was that? Sounds like a calf bawling. I better find out what the trouble is. I'll go with you. No, you better stay here. I'll be right back. Come on, boy. Hello, Steve. Oh, oh, hello. I didn't know you was coming up this end of the range. Oh, I'm just kind of drifting around. I just been putting a monogram in a couple of strays. Yes, so I noticed. Steve. There's no use talking around things. You've been putting Trampas's brand on somebody else's calf. Well, what about it? That's rustling, Steve. Oh, what's a few calves more or less to a man that's got thousands? I'm sick of nursemaiding somebody else's cows around for no more than enough to keep you on smoking tobacco. Don't talk that away, Steve. You and I have done a lot of loco things together. But there's some things that ain't only loco, they're plumb wrong. Now you take life too seriously. This whole country's taking things more seriously. I ain't... Trying to lecture you or play Sunday school on what's right or wrong, but the ranchers around here are plumb sick of having their herds trimmed out, and they'll soon be posses out with ropes on their saddles. Well, I'm carrying a nice limber one to make it easy for them. 
If they catch me. You blamed, hard-headed fool. What are you going to do? Turn me in? Nobody's talking about that. I reckon I couldn't be so at you no matter what you did. But listen, Steve. You and I have been friends too long to find ourselves lined up on opposite sides in anything like this. Oh, shucks. How do I know what I'm going to do? This country's getting too civilized, too solemn. Yeah, I got a notion I'll be moseying out to the gold fields or someplace. No need you leaving, Steve. You know, you can stay on here as long as you want. Just so you don't do nothing crazy. And if I do? We ain't going to talk about that. Not till the time comes. Only I'm just hoping the time never does come. Gary Cooper will be back in just a few moments to continue the story of the Virginian. But now, let's go to the airport in Burbank, out beyond the huge Warner Brothers studio. As the 5.30 plane takes off for New York, in the crowd are two girls. Let's listen. That must be a pretty important letter, all right, that we should drive way out from Hollywood just to send it off in the 5.30 plane. Is it important? It's an airmail special delivery to Bill Butler. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I think it's fun to see planes off. A lot of other people do, too. Look at the crowd. Well, they're not looking at the plane. No. Look at those mics and lights over there. Oh. They must be shooting a picture. Yes. Isn't that Anne Southern? Yes, it is Anne Southern. Oh, doesn't she look like a million? Mmm, some snappy suit she's wearing. Some snappy complexion, too. I wish I had one like it. Anne Southern's complexion does look lovely. It will continue to look soft and smooth and clear because this youthful star protects it. She knows that enemy to good looks, cosmetic skin, comes when you're careless. Here's what this charming star says. Of course I use cosmetics, but I don't risk unattractive cosmetic skin. I use Lux Toilet Soap because then I know I'm safe. That's good advice for you. Lux Toilet Soap's lather is active. It removes every trace of dust and dirt, stale rouge and powder that might remain to choke the pores. It's when the pores are choked, the tiny blemishes, a dull, lifeless look, enlarged pores tell you you're getting cosmetic skin. Remember, put Lux Toilet Soap on your shopping list. Buy for your complexion the same care nine out of ten screen stars use. Once again, Mr. DeMille. We continue with The Virginian, starring Gary Cooper, with Charles Bickford as Trampus, Helen Mack as Molly Wood, and John Howard as Steve. <laughs> Several weeks have passed since the Virginian warned Steve against rustling cattle. But the warning went unheeded. We find Steve now with Trampus and two other men engaged in running a herd. It's late at night, and they've made camp in a rugged hideaway deep in the hill country. Trampus, squatting beside the fire, gloats over their victory. Not so bad, eh, boys? 300 head of cattle worth more than 75 apiece. Better than herding for a living, ain't it, Steve? Say, I'm still herding them cows. We've been running them and running them hard all day long. This ain't no picnic at all. <laughs> You'll have your picnic, Steve, when we cash in on them. Hey, Pedro. Si? Put another stick on the fire. Si. Hey, wait a minute, Trampus. I'd let that fire be. It's big enough now. If anyone's following us, they'll see it sure as shooting. What's eating you, Jim? Getting scared? Well, oh, ain't no use asking for trouble. Let the fire alone. Hey, listen. When I want a fire, I'm going to have it. If there's anybody following us, there's 40 miles back, cool on their heels. Yeah, hunting for cow tracks underwater. <laughs> well, I'm going to dangle down the ravine, see how greasy's getting along. Night herding them critters. Right back, Steve. All right. Listen, what's that? Hey, ain't you never heard cattle before, Jim? It sounded like they was being disturbed or oh, something. calm down, boy. You're all on edge. Sure, everything is all right. Yeah? Well, maybe... But I'll be glad when we get rid of them cows, I'll tell you that. What if they do catch us? You can only die once. Yeah, what's life anyway? A few winters waiting for spring, a few summers wishing they'd last, and then your little six by three, six feet under the ground, that's all. Might as well be now as later. Well, that ain't the way I feel about it. I ain't itching to die just yet. Ah, right, come on, let's think of something cheerful. Sure, we sing something to cheer you up. Now, boy, Pedro, make it low and sweet. Rondo. Well, 
Whoa, boy, whoa. What's up, boss? Look down there. That fire. It's them. It's the rustlers. Easy now. The cattle must be down in that ravine. Nebraska, take three men and round them up. Sure. Shorty, you skirt around to the north and come up on the campfire from there. Take Honey and Baldy with you, but leave your horses here. Oh, set, boss. Judge, you stick with me. Okay. When I whistle, Shorty, you and your men close in. Yeah. Won't they be surprised down there? All right now. Spread out, everybody. And come in easy. We want to make sure we get them all on the... That a boy, Pedro. I always like that song. Yeah. What the? What was that? I told you they'd catch up with us. I told you they would. Get their guns, boys. Yeah, we got them, boss. All right, now stay right where you are. Como estamos? Where are you calling cards, boys? Thanks for the ditty, Pedro. It was real entertaining. Hello, Steve. Hello. I was afraid I'd find you here. Yeah? I warned you, Steve. Sure, it's all right. Well, where's Trampas? Trampas? Oh, well, you ain't here. Me and Pedro and Jim were hunting by ourselves this trip. With five cups over there on the rock, you must have been drinking with a cup in each hand. Hey, boss. Boss. Oh, here. Hey, we got the cattle all right, but whoever was a night herding them ducked. We'll get them later. What do we do now, boss? I say string them up. And yeah. me too. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. You got anything to say, Steve? Well, I guess not. You're sure of that? Yeah. All right, boys. You know what to do. Sure we do. Let's have your rope, Shorty. Now, there, there's a good tree right over there. No, no, I don't want to die. I don't want to die, shut sir. Up. But I tell you, I don't want to sure, die. shut up, Jim. You've got to take your medicine graceful. <laughs> well, come on, boys. I guess we're all set. <laughs> You riding in with us, boss? No. I'm staying here, Shorty. I got I got things to do and things to think about. I know how you feel. Uh, about Steve, I mean. He was my friend, Shorty. I know. He sure went game, though. Not a whimper out of him. He never even looked at me. Not once. He never said a word. I reckon he wanted to, boss. You see, when he was getting things ready, Steve gave me his gun. He he said to give it to you, boss. To me? Yeah. There's there's a note that goes with it. He wrote it while he was waiting. Give it to me. Here it is. I I can't see so good. Would you read it to me, Shorty? Sure. It says, So long. I couldn't have spoke to you without playing the baby. Steve. Steve. Well, uh, will you be riding in now, boss? No. No, you go along. I'm heading over to Lost Valley. What? I got things to do. I got a hunch that Trampas went that way. I'm going after him. Keep your head down, Greasy. See. Be sun up soon. I ain't taking no chances of being spotted. We gotta get away from here. They hang Pedro and Steve and Jim. We gotta get away, Trampas. We'll make it all right. We gotta watch our step. Now take it easy. We'll stay here till dark, then we head south after that. Krampus. What's the matter? Krampus, look down there. Someone is coming. He blow. Ha ha. Well, if it ain't the Virginian. See, the Virginian. <laughs> He's alone. Yeah. Hand me that rifle. Here. Out all by himself, eh? Looking for me. Well, he's looking for the last time. You hit him. He's down. <laughs> Come on, Greasy. I reckon we can start moving now. Whoa. Hello, Nebraska. How's the Virginian? Well, he's still unconscious, but the doc says he's out of danger. Hey, did you bring the medicine? Yeah, here it is. Say, you know the Virginian ought to be in a hospital. A schoolmarm's house ain't no place for him. 
Well, what'd they fetch him here for, anyway? Well, they didn't fetch him. His horse brung him right over there to that door. His horse? Yeah, funny, ain't it? No, it ain't funny. Say, he's been hanging around here so much, the horse thought it was home. Shorty, did you bring the medicine? I got it right here, ma'am. Oh, thank you. No, you ought to get some shut-eye, ma'am. You look all wore out. Oh, I'm all right. I'm not a bit tired. Anyway, there's too much to do. Well, you're sure taking good care of him, ma'am. As long as he gets well. That's all that counts. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Nebraska, I meant to ask you. Have you seen Steve around? Steve? Why, ma'am, Steve... Uh, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. We, we ain't seen Steve lately. You see, he, um, well, he don't work for the Box H no more. Oh, I thought it was funny he hadn't come around. Well, if you see him, tell him his gun is here. The Virginian had it with him that night. Well, yes, ma'am. Yes, I sure will tell him. That is, if, uh, if I runs across him. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, boys. Say, don't she know Steve was... Shh. I meant to warn you about that. She don't know a thing. Thought it might be better if we didn't say nothing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, she ain't used to things like that yeah, yet. She knew Steve pretty well. She'd be pretty upset if she knew the Virginian had a hand in on it. Well, how's the patient today? Oh, I've been up and around, Judge, feeling fine. Good boy. What's the doc say about you? All fixed. He says I can get out now anytime. Only, uh, Miss Molly, she's been taking such good care of me, I kind of hate to leave. <laughs> I can't say I blame you none. <laughs> you know, there's been some talk lately down around the town as to how we all might be doing a little celebrating sometime this spring. Celebrating what? Oh, <laughs> a wedding. <laughs> you mean, uh, me and Miss Molly? <laughs> how about it? Well, I wouldn't go putting no bets up if I were you, Judge. What's that? Not if I was you. You ain't getting married? Oh, I didn't say that. You said don't put up no bets. Sure. You know, it don't look so good for a judge to go around gambling on a pretty sure thing. <laughs> I reckon it don't, son. Oh, morning, Miss Wood. Good morning. <laughs> just uh, talking about you. Will you? Yeah, just this minute. Judge Henry, I wonder if you'd mind leaving us for a while. Why, no, ma'am, certainly not. <laughs> just getting ready to leave anyhow. Thank you. Well, uh, so long. So long, Judge. See you soon. Sure hope so. Uh, morning, Miss Wood. Well, Molly. Why didn't you tell me? What's that? Why didn't you tell me? You knew I'd find out sooner or later. I reckon you're talking about Steve. I am. Uh, well, I thought you knew, Molly. I didn't know. Not until this morning. I... Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. It had to be, Molly. You were there. Why didn't you stop it? You could have stopped it. No, you see, I was leading the posse. You? Yes. But Steve was your friend. It didn't make much difference then. Your friend. And you murdered him. Murder? What else can you call it? Molly, don't talk like that. It was hard enough. Don't make it any worse. Somebody had to do it, and I was in charge. That's our kind of law. Does your kind of law tell you to kill your friends? It ain't a question of friends or enemies. It's a question of right or wrong. I did what I thought was right, Molly. It was right. Do you think I'll teach my children to believe that? Do you think I'll help raise a new generation to approve of murder? Where you come from, they have policemen and courts and jails. We ain't got that. So when we have to, we do things our own way. I see it now. It's this life. It destroys every human feeling a person's got. It's destroyed you. It's made you cruel and ruthless and cold-blooded. Well... It won't destroy me. I won't let it. I'm leaving here just as soon as I can. Leaving, Molly? You don't mean that. I do mean it. Then you're... You're leaving me, too. Yes. I'm leaving you, too. I'm leaving everything that's base and mean and ugly. Now... Now, please get out and let me alone. Let me alone! <laughs> Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's the pride of California that it produces bigger things than any state in the Union. 
Hence, it was with consternation that California learned some 30 years ago that a baby had been born in Maine, weighing 16 and a half pounds. His precocious muscles rivaled those of the mythical stone crusher, Paul Bunyan. There's a legend back in Maine that when his mother took the heavyweight infant for his first ride in a perambulator, the baby leaped from the carriage and bowing gracefully said, Come on, Ma, you get in and let me push. <laughs> that may be a tall story, but I can vouch for the fact that he was a United States Marine when only 14 years old and three years later was a strong man in vaudeville. Today, California at last claims him. Not only as physical director of Paramount Studios and a radio physical trainer, but as a singer and little theater actor as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. DeMille. Uh, what would you like me to do? Sing, uh, act, or uh, give you a workout? I've heard you sing, I've seen you act, and I've thrown myself on your mercies in the gymnasium. Tonight is my turn. All right. I hope I can take it as well as you. Dick. Uh, Gary Cooper tells me that you're responsible for that educated fist he swings in the Plainsman. Gary's really one of the best boxers in Hollywood, along with George Raft, Sir Guy Standing, Jack Oakey, and, strangely enough, Ida Lupino. But I'm proudest of Gary. He's a real example of what regular exercise can do. Now, many people still believe that the life of a picture star is a round of parties, anything but a round of boxing. One of the reasons I asked you here is to correct that impression. Well, outside of farmers... None live a more regular, healthy life than film stars. It's a matter of necessity. If they didn't, they'd never be able to stand the strain. A well-balanced diet, plenty of sleep, and the proper exercises are absolutely necessary so they may give their best. You might be a little more explicit. Well, their taste in exercise varies. Carol Lombard and Claudette Colbert prefer tennis. Cary Grant and Randolph Scott go in for punching the bag. Bing Crosby and, incidentally, Mr. DeMille like the rowing machine. Gladys Swathout and Adolph Monju do lots of riding, and Marlena Dietrich and uh, Mae West keep their famous figures by pedaling a stationary bicycle. I've been doing my darndest to get W.C. Fields inside of the gym, but he insists he gets all the exercise he needs juggling a half dozen grapefruit every morning. Uh, my gymnasium, by the way, is one of the most historic buildings in Hollywood. It started out as a barn. Then in 1914, Mr. DeMille turned it into a studio. It was there that he made the first feature-length picture, The Squaw Man. Keeping fit has become so important in Hollywood that in the near future, every new player at Paramount will undergo a complete physical examination when signed. All of our executives will also be expected to report regularly. Take a tip from these famous people, ladies and gentlemen, and find time to exercise. I guarantee you'll be amazed at how much more work you'll be able to accomplish, how much better you'll feel. Do your exercising where you can step into a shower immediately after. And if you want to get the ultimate good from both exercise and shower, my advice is to use Lux Toilet Soap. I believe in physical culture of the skin as well as the rest of the body. It's part of my business to know what's best for a healthy skin. Lux never leaves the skin dry, as many soaps do. It has a pleasant aroma, and its cleansing qualities are distinctly superior. You can be pretty certain that when the stars go for something the way they do for Lux Soap, it must be good. And thank you, Mr. DeMille, and so long. Good night, Prodigy. <laughs> and now, back to the Virginian, starring Gary Cooper with Charles Bickford, Helen Mack, and John Howard. It's several days later. In the corral at the Box H Ranch, we find the Virginian saddling his horse. Strolling up to the gate comes Molly Wood. She stands for a moment watching him, then speaks timidly. Good morning. Molly. I mean, good morning, ma'am. May I come in? It'll be a pleasure to have you, ma'am. Thank you. You see, I, I didn't leave after all. Yes, ma'am. I, um, I changed my mind. I'm going to stay. Are you? Well, aren't you glad? That all depends. You see, folks has to be made for this country. It's rough and it's wild and it takes a strong stomach to stand for some of the things that go on out here. If you can't stand it, it's best not to stay at all. You think I'm a weakling, don't you? No, ma'am. I just don't think you understand our side of it. Perhaps not. 
but I've decided to try. I've been doing a lot of thinking since the other day. I've looked around me at people like Judge Henry and Shorty and Nebraska and their wives. People like that can't all be wrong. They're kind and good. Yes, ma'am, they are. But they don't ever let themselves forget the reason they're here. They're building a new country, ma'am. It's a big job. I know. And that's why I'm staying. I want to help. We sure need it, ma'am. Any help at all, and yours will be right welcome. Thank you. And now will you... Will you forgive me for what I said to you? Forgive you? Well, that's easy. And will everything be just as it was between you and me? That's up to you, Molly. I want it to be. I've been wanting it, too. Oh, darling. Hey, Joe. Joe. Oh, hello, Trampus. Ain't seen you around here for months. Yeah, I've been traveling. Set up around, Joe. Sure. Hey, Greasy, hey. come and get it. Hey. Say, Joe, town's getting mangy with cow hands. What's up? Payday? No, a wedding. The Virginian's getting hitched to the new school mom. The Virginian, huh? You'd think he would marry her. I heard she saved his life. Yeah, I do seem to recollect something about him being shot a while ago. Engines, wasn't it? Yeah. Somebody plugged him in the back. You don't say. Too bad I didn't finish him for good. Come on, Greasy, drink up. Yes, I'll drop <laughs> <laughs> oh, boys, boys. Hey, hey, when's the wedding, Miss Molly? Yeah, when's the big event? Speak up, boss. It ain't gonna be till till tomorrow, so you can stop pestering right now, you bunch of mangy mavericks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, say, Miss Molly, do you mind if we borrow him for a spell? Well, can I trust you? Oh, we'll all be very good. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> Not too good. <laughs> Which is the honest man? Not one of them. <laughs> well, all right, I'll trust all of you. You can borrow them, but not for too long. Oh, that's fine. Go on ahead, boys. I'll meet you in a couple of minutes. Yeah, see you over at Joe's place, boys. Right, boys. You don't mind me going with them, do you, honey? Well, of course not. The boys have their rights to you just as much as I have. I won't be long, anyhow. We'll have plenty of time alone where we're going. We'll travel west till we find just the place we want to make our home. I hope you'll never be sorry. I hope I'll always be able to make you happy. And to keep you happy. That's going to be my main aim in life. Oh, I love you. Well, you better run along now. The boys are waiting for you. Come on, boys. One more round. Yeah, come on. Take it easy, boys. I got to get married tomorrow. <laughs> Set him up, Joe. Sure, sure. Say, there's a friend of yours in town. Yeah? Yeah. Fella named Trampus. Trampus? Did he mention he was a friend of mine? He said plenty about you. All lit up and talking big. Said he'd drop in again in case there's any interest to you. Well, it ain't. I think he's looking for trouble myself. Wouldn't it be just too bad if he found it? Say, boss, we'll take this thing off your hands if you want. Yes, and save you the trouble. Just say the word. Any or all of us. No, thanks, boys. This is a matter between us two. I'm only hoping they don't drift around. Yeah, but a fella don't get married every day. That's just it. You've got to think of her. Who else am I thinking of? Come on, boys. Step right up and name it. There he is, boss. Coming in the door. Well, look who's here. Show your place, get the soda crummy, ain't it? <laughs> Never used to letting mangy foreman hang around. Shut up, Trampus. <laughs> Easy, Shorty. It's all right. Shut him up, Joe. Sure. You know, Gracie, it seems to me I heard of a fellow around here who got shot in the back. Well, so far as I know, the only way that can happen to a fellow is when he's running away. <laughs> <laughs> she running away. <laughs> Let me handle this, will you, boss? No. I don't want no trouble, Nebraska. I'm sick of this palavering around. Listen here, you. You speaking to me, Trampus? Yes, you. You've been spreading a lot of talk around about my dealing in cattle. I'm having a showdown with you here and now. Trampus, I'm trying not to have any trouble with you just now. Yeah, you've been dodging it for five years. You've been talking plenty of trouble to keep out of my way. But I got you corralled now, and I'm calling your hand. All right, what have you got? I've got the belief you're a lying, white-livered skunk. This country ain't big enough to hold the two of us. And I'm giving you till sundown to get out of town. It's too bad you had to say that, Trampus. Get out. Get out by sundown or I'll shoot you on sight. Come on, Greasy, let's get out of here. Boys, I'd like you to oblige me in this by not interfering. Sure, we understand. Sundown. Less less than a half an hour now. You're going to tell Miss Molly? Not till it's over. She wouldn't understand about this. She's... 
She's raised different. Well, we won't say nothing, boss. I got Steve's gun over at the hotel. I reckon that'd be the one to use. I'll go over now and fetch it. Come in. Oh, here you are. Sure, Molly. Oh, it's been so terrible waiting for you. You heard? About Trampas being in town? Everyone's talking about it. They say you've got to leave by sundown. I I wanted to run out and find you, but I didn't. I waited quietly in my room. I'm sorry you had to be worried, Molly. What well, doesn't matter. Nothing matters except that you're here. Let's don't think about it. What shall we do now? No? Nothing now. It ain't quite sundown yet. What? I know it's a heap worse for you. I, I wish it I wish you didn't have to wait alone. But it won't be for long. Why, what do you mean? I did my best. I let him say things to me no man ever said before. If I hadn't been thinking hard of you, I reckon I'd have killed him then. I gave him a chance to quit, but he'd gone too far. It'll have to go on now. What are you going to do? I'm not going to let him shoot me. But, but we can go away. It's not too late. You can go away and leave him here. I've got to stay. Oh, no, there must be something else. There must be. Why, well, think what it means, killing in cold blood. You don't think I want to do this? Oh, I tried to forgive the other killing, those cattle thieves and, and Steve. I forced myself to think of it as you did, law and order. But this, this isn't the same. You don't have to do this. If folks came to think me a coward, I couldn't look them in the eye ever again, or you either. Oh, that's just pride. I don't know what you call it, but it's, it's something in the feelings of a man deep down inside. Something a man can't go back on. If anybody happened to say I was a thief, I couldn't let him go on saying it. It wouldn't matter what other people thought, but I'd have to know inside of me that I thought enough of my own honesty to fight for it. Then it's to be like this always. When will it ever end? There'll always be killing to do until this country ain't a meeting place for men like Trampas. Then think of us, our life together. That's what I am thinking of. Your life has always been your own. I but can't... now it isn't. You've given it to me. Don't take it away. I can't think of that now. If you do this, there'll be no tomorrow for you and me. I'm sorry, Molly. It's got to be done. Oh, no, don't go. Come back. Please come back. You can't leave me like this. You can't leave me. Hello, boss. Hello, Shorty. And it's sundown. Yeah. I just seen Trampas. He's in Joe's place. Yeah. I guess I'll take a walk down that way. Listen, boss, stay on the sidewalk. You don't want to be stepping in one of them mud holes when you're taking aim. I'll be all right. I'll walk with you a piece. That is, if you don't mind. Of course not. Come on. Watch out for the loose boards, boss. This walk is full of them. I'll watch it. You feel all right? It's fine. We're all with you, boss. I know it. There. There he is. Just coming out the door. He sees you, boss. Yeah. I'll go on from here alone, Shorty. Sure, boss, and lots of luck. Thanks. It's sundown, Virginian. I know it, Trampas. I warned you. Well, I'm waiting. You won't have long. <laughs> boss, he all right? He never touched me, Shorty. Oh, you, you got him, boss. He's deader than a cold mackerel. Yeah, I reckon he is. Where is he? Where is he? Oh, let me through. Please, please let it's me through. It's Miss Molly. Molly. Oh, you're safe. Oh, thank God it wasn't you. It's thank all... God. <laughs> it's all right, Molly. No need to cry. Don't ever leave me. Ever again. But what you said before about there not being any tomorrow, don't that count? Nothing counts, except that I love you. Promise me you'll never leave me. Promise. Sure, I promise. But I still don't understand women, Molly. We take our leave of the Virginian, but not of Gary Cooper and Helen Mack, who come back to the microphone a little later. Activities of the motion picture world draw more newspaper men to Hollywood than national affairs draw to Washington. Outstanding among them is Sidney Skolsky, whose column, Hollywood, appears daily in the New York News and in many other papers here and abroad. Formerly author of the column, Tintypes, in the New York Sun and behind the news in the Daily News, 
Sid has also been press agent for such dispensers of beauty as Sam Harris, Earl Carroll, and George White. He would probably be offended if I said he is the best-liked film reporter. Sid is a member of that resolute minority who believe in hewing to the line of news and letting the quips fall where they may. Ladies and gentlemen, Sidney Skolsky. When you call me that, partner, smile. Well, how are you, Skolsky? I've got myself exactly where you want me. You'll never get there, Skolsky. I mean, I'm as nervous here as I make you when I visit your movie set. Well, you look like one of my pictures. Four frightened people. All four of them. I sound like a straight man. And when a columnist goes straight, that's something. That'll be enough, Skolsky. Get on with your Hollywood wash. Pretty subtle. Nobody'd ever think you were talking about Lux. Can you do better? Well, I don't use publicity blurbs in my column, and I don't intend to start with this program. But I can truthfully say I've seen Lux soap in homes of movie stars that I've visited. And I don't believe actresses keep Lux around for the same reason they keep emeralds. Well, now that you're here, make the worst of it. Don't worry, I will. Hollywood is a place where Kay Francis now keeps her diary in shorthand where Gloria Swanson has eight photographs in her bedroom of Gloria Swanson. It is a town where you need an umbrella to walk through a mist. It is a town where you heard of it, leaving a party, said to the hostess, I had a lovely evening, but this wasn't it. Where Francis X. Bushman, who was once the Clark Gable and Robert Taylor of his day, now owns a hamburger stand opposite the 20th Century Fox studio and is still serving his public. But don't get me wrong, I love Hollywood. Hollywood is a place where Victor McLaughlin, playing a scene for his picture, The Magnificent Brute, was told to run up a flight of stairs and then fall when the villain fired the first shot from his gun. McLaughlin failed to do this, and when asked why by the director, Victor answered, I'm McLaughlin. It takes more than one shot to get me. It is a town where Simone Simone doesn't pull down the shades in her apartment, and rents have gone up in that neighborhood. But don't get me wrong, I love Hollywood. Hollywood is a place where Douglas Fairbanks has his name written on the bands of the cigars he gives you. It's a town where you can drive into a drive-in stand and bring home a cake of ice wrapped in cellophane. Where the first thing Robert Taylor had to do to be a picture star was to pluck his eyebrows. Where at the preview of the picture, Pigskin Prey, they had a scene showing girls going to Yale. But don't get me wrong, I love Hollywood. Hollywood is a place where Ginger Rogers, for a wild evening, goes bowling with James Stewart on Wilshire Boulevard, where John Barrymore gives a great performance, ordering a cup of coffee in the Brown Derby. It is a town where director Van Dyke, making the flicker Eskimo, took artificial snow to the Arctic, where Jean Hollow wears a mink coat and with nothing underneath it but a pair of silk pajamas, where Jean Fowler now signs his letters, Jean Fowler, author of Jack London's White Fang. But don't get me wrong, I love Hollywood. Hollywood is a place where Charlie Chaplin keeps a huge dictionary in his bathroom, where Garbo and Rex O'Malley doing a dance in Camille fell to the floor. O'Malley helped Garbo up and rather embarrassed said to Greta, oh dear, how could I have tripped over your tiny little feet? <laughs> it is a town where Joseph von Sternberg raised a beard and when asked why answered, I'm tired of looking at my face and I'm not the only one. But don't get me wrong, I love Hollywood. Hollywood is a place where Carol Lombard can be seen reading a story in a fan magazine titled Clark Gable's Romantic Plight. It is a town where Irving Berlin, at a party, asked what song the fellow at the piano was playing, only to be told it was Alexander's Ragtime Band. Where Ted Healy asked the stooge, Jimmy Brewster, who do you think will get in, Roosevelt or Landon? And Brewster answered, what's the matter with the guy we got in there now? <laughs> but don't get me wrong, I love Hollywood. And, and always will, as long as it supplies such good copy. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Sid. We bring back the Virginian, Gary Cooper, and the school mom, Helen Mack. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. The only thing I missed tonight was seeing Gary ride a horse, as he does when he really gets out in the open. Well, riding's nothing extra special, Helen. Back home in Montana, we learn to ride a most... When we're kids, when most kids, rather, are pushing a kitty car, I guess I cut my first teeth on saddle leather. <laughs> Is that why you picked Gary for the part of Wild Bill Hickok in The Plainsman, Mr. DeMille? Well, partly, Helen. Actually, he's a perfect portrait of Hickok in look, size, and manner. Then there's a similarity between the Virginian and Wild Bill. The Virginian is the ideal American character in romance, short on speech and long on action. And Wild Bill Hickok 
is the ideal American character in fact. Hickok was not a bad man. He was a patriot. Well, then how did he get such a reputation as a killer? Well, he's supposed to have killed between 60 and 100 men, not, uh, not counting Indians. And nobody counted Indians in those days. Oh, they were just used for practice. Probably. The fact is, Hickok killed only in defense of law and order. And as he said himself back in the 1870s, there's no Sunday west of Junction City, no law west of Hayes City, and no God west of Carson City. It was to change all this, to bring respect of law to the West, that Hickok devoted his life, finally losing it, when shot by Jack McCall, who killed him for the strangest reason ever heard. Because he admired him so much. I guess it's because all this is true that I got such a kick out of making the picture. It was real. Including the danger. In riding between two horses to escape an Indian ambush, I think you did something many stars would have avoided. However, that was in the script. What wasn't in the script was your stopping the six horses that stampeded across the prairie, running away with the stagecoach. Well, after all, I had to stop them. The one they were running away with was me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, while you were running away with the picture... I hope we'll soon have another picture for you to steal. When Gary steals a picture or a broadcast, it's really grand larceny. Oh, Helen, Helen. (laughs) As far as I'm concerned, I wish this program could go on for another 60 minutes. Anything after your performance tonight, Helen, would be an (laughs) anticlimax. Then all I can add is that when it comes to radio programs and soap, give me lux every time. They're both tops. I'll vote the same ticket and include you, Helen. Thanks, Gary. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, Helen. Good night, Plainsman. Of the thousands of stories that relate the adventures of a modern Robin Hood, none has won such enduring popularity as alias Jimmy Valentine, which comes to us next Monday night with Pat O'Brien in the title role. With Pat are three other Hollywood stars, Madge Evans, Alan Jenkins, and William Frawley. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater stars Pat O'Brien and alias Jimmy Valentine with Madge Evans and an all-star cast. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.